Okay, let's get real now. We'll try to apply this to a problem. Let's say you've traveled to Washington DC for some business or pleasure or whatever it is. You've traveled to DC and you've finished your work and it's now time for you to come back to New York City or the New York City area. Now you have two choices of travel. One is you could fly from New York, uh, from Washington DC to New York City. Other is you could take the train. Both are viable options. Both take almost the same time. Flight could be a little quicker if your connections are right and if the flight is not delayed, it could be a little quicker. Oh, the problem with flights is that uh, there are often delays. Trains, let's assume for the purpose of this example, are never delayed and uh, they take a fixed amount of time. So you now have to make a choice. Let's say that you prefer to fly actually. If possible, you prefer to fly. Uh, but of course, in this particular scenario, let's say you don't want to go home late. You bought this new uh, gadget that you want to play with or you're just eager to, your, your relatives have come from uh, after a long time there at your house. You want to go quickly, meet them, talk to them. All kinds of reasons why you don't want to be delayed, right? But before you jump ahead and make a decision, as a, a true data miner, what you would like to do is to make a decision based on proper information. Okay, so uh, your assistant has put together some information for you, fortunately, and she has collected historical information about flight delays from the DC area to the New York metro area. Okay, she's got information about three airports, uh, origin airports from the DC area, which is the National Airport, which is DCA, the Dulles Airport, which is IAD, and then uh, BWI, the Washington, uh, the Baltimore Washington International Airport, three airports. So flights from three airports at various times of the day and flights to three New York airports, which is uh, JFK, Newark and LaGuardia, those three airports. And for various times of the day and various weather conditions and so on, she's got information about whether those flights were actually delayed or not delayed. And you've got about 2,200 rows of data. So can you use this to find out whether your you should really take a flight or not? In other words, let's say your flight, if you took it, would be at 3 o'clock and it's a Monday and uh, flight is leaving at 3 o'clock. It's a Monday. Let's say you're going to leave from the Washington National Airport and you're going to land in LaGuardia. So given all of these conditions, what is the probability that your flight is going to be delayed? And let's say the weather is clear today, the day you're going to fly. So now you want to find out using this data, what is the probability of a delay? Okay. So you've got a computer that you recently bought from this sleazy salesman whose name you cannot really remember much. And you've got all this data on your computer. This is just showing you a sample of the data, it's just showing you the fields that are available. So it tells you the carrier, that is which airline was it. It tells you the departure time block, right? By time block, we mean the departure timings, we've blocked them together because we don't want to make a distinction between a flight that left at 9.35 and a flight that left at 9.55, okay? So we just combined all the flights. The departure time is classified as 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. and so on. So there are 18 different blocks into which all the departure times have been classified. So you could think of that as one example of binning of numerical data. So we've put them into bins, converted them, it's categorical now. Then the destination airport, origin airport, weather, zero means the weather was clear, one means there was some weather issues like rain and storm and things like that. What day of the week was it? Uh, with I think uh, Monday being one and, and so on, Sunday being seven and whether the flight was on time or delayed. So this kind of information you have for 2,200 plus rows, right? So you say, well, this is, this is a cinch. I already know the exact Bayes algorithm. So I can put this into a tabular form and then use the table, look at my combination, use the table and finish the problem, right? So there are 2,200 cases available and this is the data. So your flight is going to be on Monday, 3 p.m. from the Washington National Airport 
to the Newark airport. The carrier is United Airlines and there's no weather problem. Good weather. Okay. It looks like a piece of cake. You just uh, look up this particular combination. You've got 2,200 rows, so you can construct that big table just like we had done for, you know, gender and uh, country. You can construct the big table and then look at this particular combination in that table and see how many of those flights were delayed, how many of those flights were not delayed, calculate the probability and you're done. Okay, so it looks like a piece of cake. So you whip out your computer sold by this uh, salesman whose name you don't quite recall. And this is your latest MacBook Air that you've bought. And unfortunately, when you go and actually look at that file, you find, let's say, I haven't looked at the file, you find just three matches, meaning out of all those 2,200 rows of data, there are only three rows that match your particular combination of uh, Monday, 3 p.m., DCA, EWR, uh, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the other two conditions were, no weather and so on. Okay, so only three matches and none of those flights were delayed. But what can you say from that? With just three matches and no delays, that doesn't really help us to say that there's no probability of the flight being delayed. It's too little data to arrive at. In fact, worse still, it could have happened that you have no data at all. Okay, so really, you started out all excited to find the probability, but it turns out that you're really back to square one at this point. Okay. So let's just look at why this happened. Was this just a coincidence that for that particular combination, you didn't have data? And then you went and let's say you go and look into it and you explore and find that that's really the case for most of the combinations. Why did this happen? Well, just take a look at this. You've got seven possibilities for day of the week, 18 buckets for departure time. Like I said earlier, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, and going up to let's say 10 p.m. So there are 18 different time buckets, three origin airports, three destination airports, eight different carriers, airlines, you know, Continental, United, Delta, et cetera, et cetera, and two different possibilities for weather. So if you look at all of these, we thought we had 2,200 rows of data. We were really proud about it. But if you multiply all of these, you get that there are, pos there are actually 18,144 different possible combinations with only 2,200 rows. Now suddenly your data looks minuscule, it looks puny, right? Because it, there's no way you're going to have all the cases. Definitely, there are 18,000 cases. You have only 2,200 cases. There are 18,000 combinations. So there's, you've got only one ninth of the combinations probably represented. So lots of combinations are going to be missing. So in retrospect, you were actually lucky that you saw three rows for your particular combination. So really, rather than being surprised one way, you should be surprised the other way. You should be surprised that you found anything at all. Okay. So what happened? Here you were working peacefully on your computer trying to solve a problem and boom, you got hit. In case you didn't realize, you had just got hit by what is called the curse of dimensionality, right? That as you add more and more dimensions, the number of possible combinations becomes so huge that you need a large amount of data to be able to solve such problems, okay? So rather than your grid looking like a small little nice grid that we looked at earlier, our table actually looks something like this. The thousands and thousands of combinations I don't know how many there are in this particular thing. I just picked up something. So lots of different combinations with many of the cells having very few values and many of the cells being actually empty. We have no data for many combinations. And it's very unlikely that any of the combinations has a large amount of data. Okay. So even though we may have lots of data, there are still very few in most cells. Many cells are actually going to be empty.